kind of over there that I can get half time over. I'm very happy to sponsor Ross and Mr. Kennedy. Well, welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Eric Huey. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs uh, for the Entertainment Software Association. We really appreciate everybody being here uh, this morning. And Governor Barry, we really appreciate your opening of your home and the Governor's Mansion. There's so much history. It's absolutely gorgeous, so thank you uh, for having us here this morning. You have the luminaries of uh, the creative economy that you talk so eloquently about in the Austin American Statesman over the weekend. And so many of the 5,000 jobs in the video game industry were created by the people in, 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 in this room. So we're so thrilled to have you. Louis, hopefully not going to break anything over there. Pay <laughs> <laughs> for it. So you break it on it. And I now want to introduce Mike Gallagher, who's the president and CEO of the Entertainment Software uh, Association. Mike is in his seventh year of the CEO. When you look at the trajectory of this industry over those seven years, Mike's being modest. He'll say, well, it didn't happen because of me, but it happened due to your leadership and your stewardship and your navigation and bringing this industry not just to the forefront in terms of its rightful place economically and culturally, but also in the, in the minds of policymakers. So, Mike, welcome to the end of the year. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you again, Governor, for, for allowing us into your home. Uh, the reason we're here is to recognize your outstanding leadership on behalf of our industry that extends back, and it's been quite a personal journey for me. And it started, Governor, in 2008 when you came to E3, and you spoke to uh, the gaming industry and said, you come to Texas, because Texas is a place where you'll be uh, have a home, we like what you're about. We love your risk-taking, your entrepreneurship, your creative energy. Come to Texas. And that was in 2008. And there were a few obstacles to that actually happening. But you didn't just give a speech. You put your effort behind it. And I recall vividly when you had the uh, ad on the, or not ad, the um, placement on your website with the we saying, come on down to Texas and make games. You know, we're really good at this. I love doing that. I love this industry. And that was exciting. And then fast forward again. We go on to uh, BioWare, when BioWare uh, came and, and set up a facility just north here, um, and you, we're sitting down with the leadership of the company, and they explained that they just bought 100 homes, 100 homes, which I think is really illustrative of what our industry brings. When we come, we come and we stay. And these are high-paying jobs. The average wage in the industry is $87,000 a year, and you knew that no way. You followed through, and you worked with us, and um, where's Heather? Where's Heather Page? Heather back here, the head of the Film Commission, our partnership with Heather has helped create an ecosystem that is helping this industry thrive here. 5,000 jobs have come because of the incentive program that you have championed. Overall, that program is nearly a billion dollars in economic lift to the state of Texas that, again, you, see, you saw as a visionary that this is the place, this is the way it should be. When you look at education, there are 300, there are 100, 385 universities that teach video games or have video game curriculum. 24 of them are right here in Texas. And there's a ranking that's done of the top 10. Two of the top 10 are here in Texas. SNU, and where, where's Gary? Right here. SNU is one of them. Yeah. And the University of Texas is, is another. And so you've seen the vision of 21st century jobs. You've seen our industries um, tie to that, and you've been committed. When you said, come to Texas, um, you were very clear the door was open, but the bar was high. And we're pleased to have been able to crest that bar with you. We applaud your leadership. We thank you for believing in us, and we look forward to the years ahead. And we have a little award that we'd like to give you. Have you opened Don't have enough hands. <laughs> <laughs> you got this. <laughs> So there you go. Awesome. Here. I actually don't think I need that. Don't get near Louie, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
me. <laughs> it's really kind of interesting. Mike, thank you. And uh, where's Blake? Blake, you know, Congressman, thank you for being here. I want to say thank you to the Congressman. Being here with us today, I know Daryl Issa, Karen Issa was uh, um, supposed to be here as well, and, and who's a great supporter of the industry, and he had a little work uh, making sure that the IRS is not looking at your tax records at the moment. So he's <laughs> back in, in Washington uh, uh, taking, a, taking a look at that little issue. So he, he was in the right place as much as we'd like to have had him here uh, with us. Um, this is a magnificent place, uh, this house. Uh, it was built in 1856, and I'm sure in, in 1856 it was the uh, uh, top technology in, in, of its time, and, and so uh, it, it looks, other than I'm sure the uh, accoutrements that are either hanging on the wall or the, the furnishings, because until about 1978, Governors brought their own furnishings. And the average length of a governor's tenure in this house was less than four years. And most of those men and women uh, who came and served here were not people of wealth. So I'm thinking it was probably pretty bare uh, for, for many of those years. It's not so much now. Uh, and it's also uh, amazingly advanced in its technology. Although it looks just like it would have looked in August of 1856. Um, well, it was probably a little cooler inside <laughs> in 1856 in August. But the infrastructure here is amazingly uh, high tech. Uh, we have a geothermal uh, system that was put in uh, for exchanging uh, the Earth's temperature with this house. Um, I insisted on putting solar panels on the roof. And they went, well, some of them said, well, you can't do that. It's not historically correct. And I said, no offense, but I crawled up on the roof of the mansion once. I know that's probably unacceptable. <laughs> and, I said, and there was air conditioning up there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that one here was <laughs> So anyway, it, it has some really uh, modern day technology involved and uh, the, the cost savings are phenomenal uh, from an electricity standpoint. Uh, it, it, it was, the electric bill here was in August of 2004 or five, and that was $5,000 a month. Wow. Not so much now. It's about $1,300 a month now. So, and then there's a lot of, there's a lot going on on this whole lot here. So anyway, it's a fabulous place to live, and uh, we, have, we have been incredibly blessed. I think we've lived here a little over uh, eight years. <laughs> Five and a half years we were out while they were redoing it. But some of you may not know that we left for, in, in I think, September, October of 07 for what was to be about an 18-month refurbishment, electrical, plumbing, and ironically, to put a fire suppression system in. And uh, about six months after our uh, departure from here, a uh, anarchist climbed over the fence and uh, probably threw a fireball. <laughs> Picking you out here. <laughs> Picking on you as well. In a good human way. But anyway, firebomb hit that front door, where that front door is. Nothing was in here. Uh, even the window panes were out. And uh, it came very close to completely consuming the building. But uh, it took us about four and a half years, of which two years of that was a lot of chefs in the uh, kitchen talking about how it should look. Um, and about two and a half years of actual construction to, to put it back in. But anyway, it is a Hopefully for another 100 plus years, uh, it will serve as, it's the fourth longest, or excuse me, the fourth oldest continually lived in Governor's Mansion in America. So it's, uh, it's got a lot of history to it. So, um, what Mike shared with you about on the uh, um, 
the gaming side of the world in particular and, and uh, uh, the entire uh, entertainment side of uh, what, what you all do is, is so important. Um, Heather Page, who does a fabulous job at our film and music uh, commission. Uh, you may have to change the name of film, music, and gaming commission because the, <laughs> yeah. the yeah. most jobs that are being created in Texas are not in the film industry. They're not in the music industry. They're in the gaming industry. Uh, but, but that's okay. Um, but, uh, we'll just keep stacking them in here. Uh, it's a, it, we believe in competition. Uh, and Congressman and I were having a conversation this morning. Um, we, we, and certainly I hope you all will join us in this because I think it's a, it's going to require a national effort and a national recognition that the states are where the real innovation is going to occur as we go forward. Uh, it's not one size fits all, and I, you know I, I don't want to drag politics into this, but you know the fact is you wouldn't be here if you weren't sad uh, in, in the political world uh, and. Washington, D.C., I don't think is the place where decisions need to be made uh, relative to uh, economic policies uh, other than having a tax code that, uh, that, that, that federally sends the message that we want to incentivize uh, people. I don't think uh, health care can be efficiently delivered uh, from a one-size-fits-all uh, decision making process in Washington, D.C. I don't think education policy can be efficiently uh, delivered from that one size fits all. And the list kind of goes on and on. For the truth of the There's a huge number. And, and trust me, this is a bipartisan offense. I mean, the Republicans have been just as bad about it as the, as the Democrats. Uh, but I really believe that if America is going to be uh, lead, lead the world uh, and, and, and really take charge of the future of this globe. It's going to happen because Washington finally recognizes that there's a few things they need to do well. They're actually enumerated in the Constitution, if they take a look at it. Um, and challenge, and, and, and to say to the states, listen, California, Michigan, Texas, Florida, you're going to compete against each other. So, what we see in the paper today, Gary, that was kind of interesting, um, what's, uh, who's the big movie mogul, Wines? Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. I think I call it Weinberg today. <laughs> <laughs> Paid a little price for that. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know him other than Harvey Weinstein. Steve. Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein was asking Governor Brown to increase taxes so that they could have what? More incentives for the film industry, to keep the film industry in California. I am totally cool with that. <laughs> for two reasons. Number one, it should be California's choice about whether or not they use an incentive program to be able to keep their film industry. Uh, in California. And secondly, I love it that they're raising taxes because that means more people will move to Texas. But I hope you understand that concept because I really believe that it is the way that our country is more competitive. And, and, and let me share with you, I mean, if you are one of these folks, well, what you are, what you are. And I'm, I'm, and I'm I'll fight to my death for that for you. Uh, to cheat, even if you're wrong. Uh, to, to, to pick and choose which of these places you are in life. But competition's a good thing. Uh, competition is, is a very powerful, powerful tool. Um, it's uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable. Bobby Jindal makes me uncomfortable every day. <laughs> and not just because he can give a hell of a speech. And he's a brilliant, uh, technician. But he's sitting on the eastern side of Texas every day coming up with ideas about how to grow businesses away from here. Rick Scott's doing it uh, in Florida. So this competition thing is a, is a, is a good thing. The, about, I don't know, two months ago, uh, Boeing made a decision 
to stay and build a 777X in Seattle. And we were, as a matter of fact, Florida thought they were going to get it. Tennessee thought they were going to get it. I was certain we were going to get it. Uh, but they stayed up in Washington because they came back and to the machinist unions and, and renegotiated their contract. They would never have renegotiated that contract if it hadn't been for other states competing for that business. And that is going to make Boeing a more competitive uh, uh, company globally. Because I can promise you Airbus is out there trying to sell their 380 or whatever they, they're working on. And that's a powerful message, this competition thing. Yes, it's uncomfortable. And I, man, most people don't know I'm a union guy. I am, I am a proud member of the AFL-CIO. <laughs> they hate it, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I believe in taking care of the workers. But the best way you can take care of a worker is make sure they have a job. It's the reason the Teamsters endorsed me every time I ran as a governor. Uh, I think. I'm pretty sure that they, every time I ran, uh, they endorsed me. Uh, but, but that's this, this whole concept of being able to create a job and create an environment with tax and regulatory and legal policies and fund accountable public schools so that you've got a skilled workforce. I mean, they ain't coming to Guild Hall uh, if, if you don't have that skilled workforce. They're just not. And, and, and so, listen, MacBook Pro is going to be built in Austin, Texas now. I mean, how many, uh, what is it, CA, what are, what are those computer uh, guys that run C, yeah. C, is that what you're thinking of? I'm talking about the machinery, the oh. CA, CCA, uh, what's that, the, the, the computerized machinery operators. CNC okay. machine? What did you say? CNC machine? CNC, CNC. Is that CNC machines. I mean, the, the people that can train in those just went through the roof here. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's one of our challenges to have enough CNC um, trained individuals to be able to fill all these jobs. It's a good challenge to have. And I'll wrap up with this because it's kind of like, okay, you know, you bloody um, Republicans and all you care about is economy. And here's the results of the policies that we put in place in the state over the course of the last decade. <coughs> We started doing this in 03. Boeing, interestingly, uh, was looking to relocate their headquarters. And they got down between Chicago and Dallas for work. This was in May, June of 01. I was just six months into my, the, the governorship. We all, you know, hoorah, what a great story to snag one of the big names in the industrial world to bring their headquarters to Texas. It'd be a huge victory. It's only 160, 165 jobs, but it was the, it was the cliche of being able to get them, get them to come to Texas. What a powerful message. And we went up there and put our dog and pony show on. Long story short, they picked Chicago. And we came back, and, and so we... We sat down and I said, okay, why were we no better at this than we were? Because I, I, could, I, I was really disappointed that we had no more focus, no more structure, no more incentives to, to be able to lay out and say, here's why you need to come. And so we came back and did a whole lot of different things. We collapsed the Department of Economic Development, which was a standalone agency. It had its own board and it was very ineffective. Uh, we collapsed it, made it a trustee um, agency, if you will, within the governor's office. No board got rid of all of that, where they could be nimble and, and quickly. Uh, we started looking at film and music commission as uh, they had no incentives, no, no way to really um, go be competitive. We started tax policy and regulatory policy. We passed the most sweeping tort reform in the nation in 2003. Anyway, long story short, we started putting in place things that men and women in your business that have to be thoughtful about the bottom line that it mattered to them. 
During all of this, a well-placed source in Boeing sent us a message that one of the reasons that they chose Chicago over Dallas Fort Worth is that the spouses of the decision makers didn't think the cultural arts were as expansive as they would be comfortable with in Dallas Fort Worth versus Chicago. Now, I'm not going to argue here for the sake of argument whether that was a reality or not in 2001. But let me tell you what's happened in this state in the last decade. Fort Worth built a new museum of modern art. The Bass has built one of the finest symphony halls in the world. The Kimball Museum expanded greatly. Fort Worth is also the home of one of the finest zoos in America. Dallas built two performing arts facilities during that period of time, the AT&T and the Meyerson. The American Film Institute moved their headquarters from California to Dallas. The Perros just opened last year a new um, uh, museum of natural science. There's an entire theater district in Dallas. This little government university town opened a new museum of modern art. The Long Center of Performing Arts has opened in the last decade. The Topfers added an entire wing onto the Zachary Scott Theater. San Antonio is opening a new performing arts facility. And tonight, in a city that has got a booming theater district, there are more theater seats available in Houston, Texas, than any other city in America outside of New York City. Happened in a decade. Didn't happen because government did it. As a matter of fact, I would argue that government would not have and should not have built one of those. The private sector did. Because we left more money in the hands of the private sector. You will come back, some of you, in November to the United States Grand Prix, which is in this city. You're here for South by Southwest, the largest film music in festival in the world. That's what good economic policies can do for your, for your state. And I suggest that's the argument that we need to have, that's the debate we need to have, that's the discussion that we need to have as a country about, look, I get it, not everybody wants to be Texas. And that's okay. Matter of fact, that's real okay. <laughs> because if you want to live in a place that has high taxes, and has a very onerous regulatory fund. New York's always going to be available. <laughs> <laughs> and that's cool. It's the way it should be. And then, and, and, and this goes all the way across the spectrum in the, in the social issues as well. You need to go find that place you're comfortable with living. But we can't do it if Washington's going to insist upon trying to make this little round peg fit in that square hole. It's just not going to be comfortable for anybody. So uh, the, the, your industry is so important. It's so important because you're, you're international. And you're important because a lot of people pay attention to you. You're hip. You're cool. And that's good. But I hope you will be engaged in this conversation as we go forward over the next 24 months and ask people if... They, they think that uh, this whole concept of uh, uh, the states competing against each other isn't a better um, blueprint for America than one size fits all. So you didn't know you were going to get lobbied on a hardcore political <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think you all are very, very important. It's the reason that when we were analyzing where we wanted to be focused, um, the, the gaming industry really jumped out to me. Place that uh, I thought was custom made for Texas, and uh, so far so good. And uh, Mike, again, I want to say thanks to you and to, to all of you for being here today. Louis Hines, um, just before you get out of here today, tell Louis thank you because he is, he is the reason you are here today. Because <laughs> he put the bag on the first lady and. <laughs> Because <laughs> he knew not to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Louis, get 
get the hell out of here. Man. <laughs> 10 o'clock on Monday morning? Come on. <laughs> anyway, he does a great job for you. Um, any questions? I'm, I'm, I got till, I got till noon. I'm not sure. It's my day off, man. <laughs> We stay here for another about about another ten months, and, uh, and I'm gonna be out looking for a place to live. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm out of public housing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Governor, for having us. I'm Sue Hilbert on with Microsoft, and uh, I was telling you you rocked the house at CPAC last week. So you're gonna come out to Iowa or New Hampshire soon? Yeah. Actually, I was in Iowa um, a week before last. I'm going to spend the next 10 months really engaged in making sure that governors that share that whole Tenth Amendment concept get elected. I mean, I'm passionate about it. I just, I've done this long enough now. Um, I, will, I will finish, on the 20th day of December, I will have been governor for 14 years. Uh, now, Terry Branstead is, <laughs> Terry served for 16 years and he was gone for like 14 and he came back and he's, he's Finishing up four, so Terry's going to be somewhere around. I mean, I'm kind of a I'm a piper compared to Terry <laughs> Branch, really. but uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time going to states where, and, and frankly, for, for governor, I'm going to be in California uh, again. I'm going to be out there. I'll probably be running some ads. How many of you actually live in California? Or, or there, yeah, um, you know, I was out.